So enjoy so the coffee break. I'll be talking about Tafta TTIP. The, the two names are because people called it, first of all, Tafta, the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement. And now the official name is TTIP, which is Trade and uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And what I'll be talking about are quite a broad range of issues uh, trade, internet, and democracy, because it touches on all of those. And what I hope to do is to show how uh, great an impact TAFTA TTIP will have on so many areas, if we get the slides, that is. So um, I'll just talk a little bit while we're waiting for that. Uh, trade agreements, um, nominally TTIP is a trade agreement. Uh, trade agreements, there are lots of them. I actually had a look on Wikipedia uh, and there seem to be about 50 or 60 of them. Uh, some of them are quite well known, like NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Most of them are completely obscure uh, that I'd certainly never heard of. And I think that reflects a general view that trade agreements are very boring and that nobody really cares about them. OK, we have technology. That's great. So those are just some of the um, free trade agreements. As I say, most of them are just completely you know, unknown. So they're boring, and therefore they're invisible. Nobody really pays much attention to them. Uh, and that was true um, until certainly recently, when if you stopped anyone in the street, even in somewhere like Berlin, which is very cosmopolitan, I doubt whether many people could actually name a free trade agreement. But last year, something happened. We had ACTA. And millions of people became aware of free trade agreements, and a lot of them actually took to the streets. Uh, ACTA is the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. And it involved the EU and a group of other nations. And it was nominally about counterfeiting. It was like fake drugs, fake aircraft parts, which exist apparently. Um, and it was trying to stop that kind of thing, which you know nobody's really going to object to. And yet, people took to the streets on the 11th of February. They were organized online by Netzpolitik here in Germany, the Quartet du Net in France. And, and Germany led the way, really, in that uh, fight against ACTA. Uh, 100,000 people or so around the country. Uh, and the reason for that is because the copyright industry, as ever, managed to take something good and ruin it. They took a counterfeiting the uh, treaty that was going to try and stop fake medicines, fake aircraft parts, and said, well, we'd rather like digital piracy to be included in that. Even though analog and digital worlds, as you know, are completely different, they insisted that they be bolted together. And this led to some huge problems. I just want to quickly run through those because it's actually relevant to TAFTA. For example, civil damages. So you can sue somebody who uh, shares copyright material. They brought in a clause that said that the copyright holder could include any measure of value, including the retail price. Now, if you think of your smartphone, you could easily have 10,000 MP3s on that. If you got sued for the retail price, you're looking at about 20,000 euros for your smartphone. And that's because in the digital world, it's not the same as in the analog world. Things are even worse for criminal damages. This is where they take you to prison, or if you're really lucky, you get extradited to America. They said that criminal damages must be applied, at least in cases of copyright or related rights piracy, on a commercial scale. And that's a phrase that you'll find in lots of treaties. But in ACTA, they added this further phrase, for direct or indirect economic or commercial advantage. And it's this indirect business. In other words, if you've got a website and you've got a Google ad on it and you've also got a link to an uh, unauthorized uh, copy of something, you are getting indirect benefit and therefore you can be extradited to America. And this, will be added, this was added in ACTA and this was indicative of the general kind of bad faith of ACTA. They kept on adding things to make it worse. There was also a digital chapter specifically about the internet and basically they wanted to turn your ISP into a policeman. They wanted to make the ISPs complicit um, outside the law. This wouldn't be through law, it would be through agreements. And this was a very, very worrying uh, trend. Happily, it got thrown out because of a lot of Germans taking to the street and a lot of other people. On the 4th of July last year, the plenary vote in the European Parliament voted it down by 478 votes to 39. Interesting, there's so many abstentions. Why are there so many abstentions? Well, these are basically the cowards. These are the people who wanted ACTA but were so frightened of you that they didn't dare say it, so they abstained, which I think, again, is interesting. It was a remarkable majority and a remarkable rejection of an international trade agreement negotiated by the Commission. That had never happened before. Normally what happens is the Commission negotiates, presents it, and the European Parliament rubber stamps it. 
As the actor rapporteur pointed out, it was the first time the European Parliament had used powers under the Lisbon Treaty to say no. So that was a tremendous slap in the face for the European Commission. And as Martin Schulz also said, it demonstrated the growth of a European public opinion, which brings us to TAFTA TTIP. First of all, I said at the beginning I was talking about trade agreements. TAFTA TTIP is not a trade agreement. It's mostly about what they quaintly call non-tariff barriers. And the way they frame this is very interesting because they're talking about getting rid of barriers so that people can make lots more money. But those barriers turn out to be things like health, safety, employment, and environmental regulations, which unfortunately reduce people's profits. I mean, I know it's tragic. And so what they want to do is to get rid of a lot of them. But of course, you can't say that, so they're called barriers, okay? They're really bad things. They're non-tariff barriers. They're not regulations protecting health, nothing like that. Okay, so if you go to the European uh, Commission's website, they have the whole section about TAFTA TTIP. And they say again and again and again, 119 billion euros GDP increase. Sounds fantastic. I mean, you know, really wonderful. Uh, what they don't mention is that that includes getting rid of all of the health regulations, the safety regulations, environmental regulations. If you only get rid of the tariff regulations, you look at 24 billion. And that is not a figure they mention because they like to talk about this 119 billion, which they say is 500 euros for you and me. Uh, the other thing they don't mention is that this will be in 2027. And as a wise person said, you know, making predictions is hard, especially about the future. And in 14 years' time, I don't think any of these figures are going to be anything like this. So there is a really big con going on here. Right. Oh, well, actor. Let's talk about actor a bit. That nice man, Karl de Rucht, who is the commissioner responsible for both ACTA, the one who had his face slapped by the European Parliament, and also for TAFTA, said, ACTA is one of the nails in my coffin. I'm not going to reopen that discussion. Really, I mean, I'm not a masochist. I'm not going to do this by the back door. He certainly sounds like he didn't enjoy ACTA, did he? And indeed, in the EU negotiation directives, which is the boring official document telling the negotiators what to do, it says, but for intellectual monopolies like copyright and patents, they, it shall not include provisions on criminal <coughs> sanctions. So they won't be extraditing you to America this year. That's good news. However, they say nothing about civil ones. Now, being the boring kind of person I am, I was recently reading the European Union Singapore Free Trade Agreement, which came out a couple of weeks ago. It was initialed on 20th of September, which means that it still has to be passed by the European Commission, Council of Ministers, and ratified by the European Parliament, the ones that said no to ACTA. What's interesting about this really boring agreement is they have cut and paste sections from ACTA in it, because nobody reads these things apart from me and about two other people. But they have cut and paste the wording literally. And it's our old friend, any legitimate measure of value that right old submits, uh, it's, you know, your smartphone is going to cost you 20,000 euros again. Now, the interesting question is, what's the European Parliament going to do? Because if they just sort of say, well, I suppose it doesn't really matter, does it? it's only Singapore, it's nothing special. If they agree to this, then presumably you can just stick it in TAFTA TTIP too, because the negotiators say, well, you, you've agreed once, so let's put that in anyway. And then the question is, well, what else are they going to put in? Well, they put in the digital chapter that turns your ISP into a policeman. And so there's a very interesting issue here about actors at the back door, despite what that nice Mr. Carol Hook says. However, that's not the real problem. The real problem is the famous ISDS, about which people said, who, what? Because no one has heard of this. Investor state dispute settlement. Sounds boring. In fact, it's even more boring than trade agreements. It's, it's just the most boring thing in the world. I've been conducting a kind of mini poll recently. I go to a lot of meetings with a lot of very clever people who know what they're talking about. And I say, well, what do you think about this ISDS stuff? And they go, what? They've never heard of it. And I think this is a big problem because ISDS is a huge threat for reasons I will explain. So let's just talk about the facts of what it is first. The basic idea is good. It's a bit like actors. Started out good and became less good. So the basic idea is to protect investors from arbitrary government actions or weak court systems. So the idea was if you're investing in a banana republic, you do not want the government marching in with machine guns saying, I rather like your factory, it's mine now. And so the whole point of this kind of trade agreement using ISDS was to give you a way of stopping that back happening or at least fighting back. It allowed companies to sue a nation. And it could actually take a whole nation to specialist external tribunals. So if you had corrupt courts, 
in the country, it wasn't a problem because you went outside the country. Those tribunals consisted of three lawyers. Uh, unfortunately, those three lawyers can also represent the companies. And so you can have a situation whereby a lawyer represents a large multinational in one of these courts, and then next week it is the judge for the same company. There is no conflict of interest rules. Oh, there's another problem. They can give unlimited awards against the government. Think of as many zeros as you like, and that's fine. Last year, Occidental was awarded $1.77 billion against Ecuador, that well-known rich country that has so much money to throw around, it likes to pay money to oil companies. Oh, and you can't appeal either. So I think you can see there are a few problems here. But it gets far worse, because if you look at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD ISDS report, it's, it's now such a big issue, there's a report every year about this stuff, which again, only I and three other people read, but there you go. Last year there were 58 cases, the highest has ever been. In total there have been 518 cases. 95 countries, half the world are involved in these. 15 EU countries, half the EU. Oh, what a surprise. Mostly it's American companies that seem to be doing this, so I can't imagine what that is. And uh, last year, 70% of the cases were resolved in favor of those companies. So let's look at some of the cases, because I said it's about banana republics walking in with machine guns trying to steal your factory. Let's look at the first one. Australia wanted to add warnings to its cigarette packets, so it got sued by Philip Morris, who said that he couldn't do that using ISDS. Canada wants to ban a pesticide that's killing everything, but a company doesn't like that, so they're being sued. Uh, Quebec is bringing in a moratorium on fracking, but they didn't like that, so they're going to sue them. El Salvador, for some reason, didn't want a huge hole dug in its land, and so it's being sued by a mining company. Germany wanted to phase out nuclear power, and that's being sued because, well, the nuclear power manufacturers don't like that. Mexico didn't really want a load of poisonous stuff next to its citizens, so it's being sued over that. And lucky Uruguay is in the same category as Australia. Wanted to add a bit of warning about cancer and death to its cigarette packets, and Philip Morris said, well, we don't really like that. But it gets even better. Eli Lilly, I'm sure you know, is a large American pharmaceutical company. And a couple of uh, years ago, they got a couple of patents for some of their drugs. And then, as often happens, the, this was contested in the courts, and those patents were rescinded because they didn't meet the conditions that Canada sets for giving patents. Again, this is quite common. If you don't meet the rules, you don't get the patents. But Eli Lilly didn't really like that. He thought, well, we had the patents and you've taken it away, so we'd rather like $100 million, please. Um, and it invoked the ISD clause in the NAFTA agreement that I mentioned. And then it thought, no, actually, you're right. We shouldn't have done that. What we really want is $500 million. Um, for the two drugs. So let's look at the logic of this, okay? Eli Lilly says that Canada owes it $500 million because Canada has not met minimum standards of treatment. What that means is that whereas the US is happy to give patents on sandwiches, Canada has some rules. And Canada applied these rules and said, well, no, that isn't actually worth a patent. And Canada now says, well, that's unfair. And therefore, we're going to sue you for $500 million. Because, you see, Eli Lilly had an expectation of profit. And this expectation of future profit has been unjustly upset. These are words I'm quoting from Eli Lilly's official uh, submissions. So they had a profit expectation in the future, and they were thinking about what they're going to do with that lovely money. And they're not going to have it now. And they're really upset. So basically, they say that there has been an indirect expropriation of their future profits. Just think about that for a moment. A company is saying that it has future profits, and if those future profits are reduced in any way, it can sue a government for doing that. So ISDS was originally about banana republics and having your, your factory stolen by people with machine guns. We're now talking, thanks to Eli Lilly and the way this whole thing has gone, of applying it to patents and other intellectual monopolies, and bring in the idea of expectations of profits and expropriation when those profits aren't as much as they thought they were going to be because something has happened within the country. So let's just look at what, how that might apply if TAFTA TTIP has ISDS. And the bad news is America wants ISDS and the EU wants ISDS, which means that they both want it, so it's going to be in there. 
at the moment. So Germany, as you know, did something really sensible recently. The German parliament voted to ban software patents. Actually, it voted to ban them again because according to the European Patent Convention, Article 52, another document only I and three other people read, software patents are not possible. But the European Patent Office loves patents so much it decided to give several thousand of them anyway. And so there are now these strange software patents in Europe, even though software patents don't exist. And so the, the German uh, parliament wanted to clarify the situation and said, well, let's pass another law saying that, in fact, we really meant it and software patents don't exist. Now, imagine what would happen. Let's just imagine, hypothetically, there is a, an American software company on the northwest coast of America, just completely hypothetically. And so suppose in this hypothetical software company has a few thousand patents in Europe, just hypothetically. And now Germany, rather sensibly, brings in the law that says these patents aren't valid. What do we think is going to happen? Could it be that lawyers at such a hypothetical company would in fact sue Germany for 10 billion euros? I think possibly. We're also in Europe trying to bring copyright into the, well, I hesitate to say the 21st century, more like the 20th century. Anyway, the fact that every day everyone in this room is breaking the law as far as copyright is concerned because everything you do on the internet is illegal. In fact, there's a very interesting calculation um, by an American professor who worked out how much he, as a professor, owes the copyright companies. It comes to $4 billion a year. Anyway, so there's sort of one or two tiny ideas of changing copyright to make it slightly more rational and slightly more realistic in terms of what we do. Things like text and data mining, things like orphan works. But again, imagine that directive went through by some miracle, the European Parliament. What would happen? Well, I suggest that US publishers would say, well, our expectation of profits has just gone down because we were going to price gouge you for, for another 50 years and you stopped us doing that. So I'm afraid we're going to have to sue the European Union for you know, 20 or 30 billion euros. Similarly, in the UK, there's talk about bringing in fair use provisions instead of the uh, current system. And if that were brought in, the US publishers could say, well, our profits have gone down. Even things like uh, IPRED, I'm sure some of you know, the directive on enforcing intellectual monopolies. That crumbled a few years ago when they, they just couldn't get the thing together. And publishers might argue, well, you know, our expectation of profit has gone down, so again, you owe us a few billion euros. Basically, anything that is in the favor of the public and against the interests of the corporate world is caught by ISDS. ISDS only allows corporates to get richer and the public to get poorer. And that applies to every field. In fact, um, sorry, that's what I said. In fact, it's worse than that because it actually applies it to everything else. I said at the beginning this issue of non-tariff barriers. Uh, just assuming by some miracle that the European Commission grows a spine and actually says no to some of the American demands because currently the American industry has been quite uh, open about the fact that they want to have the right to sell chickens washed in chlorine. They want to have the right to sell cows pumped up with hormones and they want to have the right to sell uh, genetically modified organisms in Europe and that's for them what Tafta TTIP is about. Now the European Commission has said oh no we definitely don't want to do that. Um, personally I don't see how they're going to say no given they've already signaled they're desperate for a, an agreement. But anyway just assuming hypothetically in a parallel universe that they managed to stop that happening. The point is even if they did stop that happening then American companies might be able to claim that their expectation of profit has been harmed by the fact that they didn't bring in all those regulations allowing such stuff. And so you might get to the situation where the European Commission would say, well, we quite agree, we don't really want this stuff, but, you know, TAFTA TTIP is forcing our hand. If we don't agree to allow all this yummy stuff into our supermarkets, we're going to get sued. So we have to bring in all these things we promised we'd never bring in. And that really is one of the key issues about TAFTA TTIP is that it places companies above the law. It lets them turn into the kind of patent trolls of the global trade treaty system. It lets them blackmail governments. Okay, that's one key problem. Uh, I just want to talk about another big problem, so just two things. ACTA was in part a revolt against secret deal making, but TAFTA TTIP is going to be uh, negotiated behind closed doors with minimal information. Some of it's going to be given to the European Parliament, but um, restricted. And there's practically nothing going to be given to the uh, public. <coughs> so there's a new fight for transparency here. But it turns out we have a new surprising ally here. 
also known as the NSA. Why? Well, the NSA has been spying on the European Union embassies in the US. It's been spying on European companies, thanks to those nice people at Microsoft giving them all their flaws to exploit. It's been spying on the entire internet, and it's probably been doing some other things we don't know about either. The point is, TAFTA TTIP isn't a secret. The Americans already have every copy of every document. So the idea that we've got to keep TAFTA TTIP secret is naive. It's also naive to think that China and Russia don't have it. They have thousands of extremely able people who can break into any system. They've already got all the documents, and they will have every document that is produced. Oh, and large companies and industry groups also have it because the Americans give it. They actually provide better access to large companies than to their own politicians. Senators and Congress people don't get to see these things. Companies do. So, well, who does that leave? Oh, yeah, the public, yeah. Um, so what about negotiating in public? Sounds a great idea. I'm, I'm afraid that Carol Duke person says, no, you, you can't really do that. It's just not possible. Well, not possible apart from the fact that WIPO has been doing it for 30 years. Not possible apart from the fact that WIPO has just negotiated and concluded the Treaty for the Blind, one of the most contentious treaties in recent years, all done completely openly. The documents were available, structured stakeholder input, reports, summaries, webcasts. I mean, it's only recently with ACTA, with TPP, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and with TTIP that this secrecy has come in. But we need transparency. If people don't know what's being negotiated in their name, then they can't actually interact with the people who are supposedly representing them. So democracy requires that transparency, and secret negotiations are really profoundly anti-democratic. So to conclude, going forward, what can we do? Well, the big problem is trade agreements are complex and obscure. I mean, they really are pretty boring. TAFTA TPP is even more complex and even more obscure. We, we can't possibly explain all that to everybody. So I think we just need to concentrate on two issues. One, ISDS has got to come out. Why? Because it's unnecessary. It's designed for Western investors investing in developing countries where the legal systems are weak and where governments are capricious. I don't think the US legal system is weak somehow. I don't think the EU system is weak. Maybe the governments are capricious, but I mean, we can't do much about that. The point is, ISDS is completely inappropriate. It shouldn't be in there at all. It's anti-social. It allows health and safety regulations to be completely overruled. And it's anti-democratic because you let three lawyers sitting in secret decide what laws should apply around the world. OK, if we're going to take out ISDS, I think it's only fair we put something in. How about transparency? We need all tabled EU documents to be made public. By table, I mean once they go on the table in the negotiation room, they're not secret. So there is no reason not to publish them. Even de Roos claim that you have to have secrets falls down once it's on the table. All tabled documents have to be public. But we've got to go beyond that. We need full transparency for TAFTA TTIP. Every trade agreement must be like WIPO. Before the internet, OK, that would have been hard. How do you cope with thousands of documents changing on a daily basis being distributed to thousands of people? You can't do it. With the internet, it's not just possible. It's actually indispensable for true democracy in the digital age. And so TAFTA TTIP is going to be, I think, a huge flashpoint for all of these issues the trade, internet, and democracy. And, and really, we have got to fight very hard here because this is determining the future of not just trade, but also internet and democracy. Thank you very much.